previous episodes, I mentioned that we would cover digital signatures and hashing. And although they don't necessarily relate directly to network security, they are still interesting topics to understand and perfectly illustrate the the breadth and the width of the term security when related to IT matters. You still need a network to carry digital signatures and you still need a network to download files. And hashing ensures that you can rely on that topic covered in episode one, the I in CIA, integrity, to ensure that the downloaded file um, has not been messed with while in transit. So digital signatures, what exactly are we talking about? Well, when you consider an analog signature, it's simply a sequence of pen strokes written or drawn in a particular way as a means of identification and as a way to prove that a particular person actually stood by what was written on that document. An interesting characteristic of an analog signature is that it is never exactly the same every time you sign, but close enough for a human to almost accurately detect its authenticity. Its weakness is if you make it exactly the same every single time. At that point, you start to have doubt um, you know, whether it is true signature or it was copied or photocopied or forged in this case. So difference mostly denotes authenticity. Digital signatures, on the other hand, have the same purpose as analog, but they are always the same, and any deviation indicates fraud. So a true digital signature is usually bought uh, through a thorough process of identification where a number of people who might know you will vouch for you, uh, one or more forms of ID, etc. And then on handing over a cash to a digital signature entity, you will be issued with a specific type of file which gets installed on your machine and will forever identify you. On writing an email, for example, you will use your digital signature to authenticate that the message originated from your machine at a certain date and time, etc., and the recipient can be absolutely sure of its authenticity. Of course, uh, it's important that uh, not protecting your machine with strong passwords or leaving your machine unlocked will pretty much invalidate everything I've just said, and therein lies its danger. So what about hashing? Because this too is an important concept to grasp because it allows you to determine that a file, such as a firmware update or a security update, hasn't been tampered with before it got to you, almost always, again, through a network. Hashing is basically the function of reducing any input string into a fixed size string. An example is the hash function uh, called SHA-256. Anytime you hash any type of digital content, it will output a string of random characters, and in the case of SHA-256, it will produce this hexadecimal string, 64 characters in length. This hash function has a few really interesting characteristics. Firstly, it is one way only. Once you have that string of 64 characters, it is impossible to reverse the process to work out what the original material or source was before you applied the hash function. To illustrate the point, it is totally different to encryption and decryption. Decryption reverses the process of encryption. Even more interesting is that changing just a single character in the original source means that a completely new string of text is created and is completely different to the original in every way. It is deterministic. If you have the same input string, you will always get the same output string. This is how you guarantee authenticity. Irrespective of the size of the input string, the output string will always remain the same length. Let me demonstrate. Okay, so what I'm gonna do over here is I'm just gonna write this little string of text over here. Uh, you have received a uh, 40% increase. Woo, that would be good, wouldn't it? 
All right, so now I just hit File, Save, this file, and now I'm gonna run it through a SHA-256 uh, hash function. So here we go, I just drag it into, uh, into this app, and now you can see it's created that SHA-256 uh, string, which is made up of 64 hexadecimal characters. I'm just gonna copy it at this point in time, and then I'm going to paste that into a document and just make the font size bigger. There we go, there's that 64-bit uh, um, key. Now, I realize I've made a mistake. It's not 40%, so let me open up this file, and I'm gonna change just one character, just one, and I'm gonna change the zero, uh, remove the zero from the 40 so that it's a 4% 4, 4 increase. That's how much you've received, 4% increase. I'm gonna save that, and I'm gonna repeat the process. I'll drag it again into the SHA-256 app, and you can see it's created a new, um, a new string. So let me copy that and let me paste it underneath the original one. Have a look at these two. Completely different strings. Absolutely no way to say that the second one is simply a single character change from the first. Where is this used? It's used in all sorts of places. For example, if, um, if you go to GitHub, our GitHub repository, and you want to download a file uh, for one of our switches, for example, an update, firmware update, you will see a, a SHA-256 or a SHA-512 string of text. That just means when you download this file to your own computer, you can run this app or Python script or whatever it is, and you can verify that the SHA-256 string that it produces on your machine is the same as the one on GitHub. If they match, that means that you have 100% authenticity. No one has messed with that file. There's another term, MACSEC. We've spoken about it in other welcome series before, but let's take a minute or three to cover it here. It's a security feature found on many of our switches running either Fabric or Switch Engine. And it, it's a feature that will encrypt the traffic flowing out of a port in a point-to-point -point network configuration. And it does it all at wire speed, uh, no extra overhead. Turning on MacSec is, is like laying an extra security blanket over your network traffic with zero hit on performance. When you combine it with Fabric and its ability to hyper-segment and use an IPless control plane, and then you add on top of that universal ZTNA, which brings security to every application, every user, cloud or local, you really end up with a fantastically secure platform to build on. So now let's move on to talking about the topic of complexity in general and then in security specifically. In customer conversations, one of the topics that comes up again and again is the topic of complexity. Look, let's not kid ourselves here, right? Networking can get very complex. And the more you dig, the more complex it becomes. And while companies like um, Extreme Networks have done absolutely huge amounts of work to simplify things, uh, for example, with fabric technology, in general, it's still pretty complex. Tools and applications that offer you a thousand choices and options in the way you set up or configure things sound absolutely fantastic. But I would argue that if you cannot master the main reason you purchased an application on your own or with very little help, the probability of that tool or application offering you the best value is severely hampered because the simple truth is people hate complexity. If you look at almost every successful company in the world, the one thing that they have managed to do brilliantly is remove complexity from the equation. IBM gave us the PC, which removed the complexity of working on and, and managing those huge mainframes. Operating systems like Windows and Mac OS moved us from the world of having to remember hundreds of commands, like in DOS, to be able to do the simplest of tasks, to a simple mouse movement and click. And I know, the, the Linux aficionados amongst us are choking on their coffee. 
I'm referring to the overwhelming way computers are used today rather than the specialist use of computers, mostly for infrastructure control and management. No GUI can beat the speed that a Linux guru can get out of a command line. Now, when Apple first brought out the iPhone and you unlocked it with a simple swipe, it blew our minds, right? It, it really did because of how intuitive it was. Simplicity one. I know, I work for Nokia. The more complex things are to install, to run, to maintain, to troubleshoot, the more likely that people will make mistakes, that they won't fully implement or commit, that they will use the minimal features of a tool because it's just too complex to use uh, in its entirety. In other words, you pay for a Ferrari, but you only use it to go to the local store for your grocery shopping. It's obvious immediately that whatever security solution you're thinking about or talking about or, or possibly even testing, that simplicity is an absolute must for it to be a success. If you make it too complex, it's just not easy for people to adopt and they will find other ways to get around that complexity. Finally, complexity also means resources. The more complex a security application is, a security application protecting your network, in general, it means the more resources you need to master that application, to make sure that it's always running at optimal. So simplicity, if I can give you an application that just does five things, but does it really well, it will always beat the, the situation where you have a thousand options and none of them are implemented well. So that's it for this particular episode. Like in other episodes, right at the end, there will be an on-screen summary of this episode, which you can screenshot. If you prefer to get a PDF of that summary, well, if you scan this QR code, it will automatically open up an email and it will put our address there together with the specific code for the episode, and we will send you that, uh, that PDF. Over to Louise uh, to, to finish up. Yeah, so that's it from us. Um, don't forget to tune in to episode five and we'll give you details on how you can take the exam. But for now, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in episode five. Cheerio.